start back again all right um, we're going to talk about our blue planet okay uh, was it the result of a big bang or an awesome god and i think you know where i stand on that already um, uh, there are a lot of things uh, we take for granted uh, we take for granted the sun's going to come up tomorrow right uh, we take we take our home here on this earth for granted, I think, often. Um, and um, it's really a specially designed place uh, for life, for us, I think. And, um, and so I want to talk about uh, that and just kind of help you see that, you know, the scientists talk about, well, they're going to find all these different kind of planets out there. And they're sure that there are going to be some planets that have the right conditions for life. And they're sure there's going to be other life forms. Well, um, if there are, I think God made them. Uh, I don't think they're going to find life forms that came about by accident for a lot of the reasons we just talked about. Um, but um, I don't know what kind of planets they're going to find, but I'll be interested to show you a little bit about, just to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, how they're thinking about planets now, which is different than they were before. But um, let's think about the Earth for a minute. We're in, whoops, we're off scale this bit. We're, uh, deep space is what? It's cold, it's dark, and it's empty. Okay, and so do we have a feel for that here on this planet? Um, not really. Um, so what do we have here on the Earth? Uh, we have light, heat, water, food, and oxygen. Okay, and then we have other things that we actually need too. But in the midst of dark, empty, cold space, we have exactly what we need. Now, just think about that for a minute. We're hanging out here in the universe, uh, and we just, quote, happen to have um, exactly what we need. Uh, and the earth is, is, as the Bible says, it's hanging on nothing. Okay, that's what the Bible says in Job. Um, and that's not a bad description. We, it's, it's hanging on nothing visible. We understand now that gravity is holding us in place. Uh, earlier civilizations thought that, um, that elephants were under the earth holding it up on their backs. Uh, another civilization thought it was a bunch of turtles stacked on top of each other and that they were holding the earth up. Um, and so there have been a lot of kind of you know, interesting theories about what, about what's holding the earth up. But the Bible, I think, has it accurate in that sense is that the earth is hanging on nothing visible. Matter of fact, scientists still don't really understand exactly how gravity works. Um, they, have a, they have a name for the particle that they think, that's, they call it a graviton. The trouble is they don't know anything about it. Uh, they don't know anything about gravity. They don't know, they, they don't know how to block gravity. There's no way to stop the gravitational force that anybody knows, despite what they do on Star Trek. Okay, but um, uh, but yeah, it's a it's a fascinating thing. Uh, just how cold is deep space? It's three degrees above absolute zero. And absolute zero is as cold as things can theoretically possibly be, all right? And so space is almost as cold as you can get. That's, for those of you who do Fahrenheit, it's minus 460 degrees Fahrenheit out in the deep space, all right? So it's not just a little cold, it's a lot of cold, okay? Uh, and so we're a lot of degrees above 400, minus 460 uh, Fahrenheit. Okay. Uh, how dark is it in deep space? I, I, I found this was interesting. This gives you an idea of what the, at the top, gives you an idea of what the sun looks like, would look like from the different planets. Okay, and so you see what it is from Earth. You see that every day. 
but there's what it would look like at Mercury, and you can't even, you can't probably even see that little dot up there from what it looks like from Neptune. Okay, so you can't even hardly see the sun from Neptune, but you can see it um, from the Earth, obviously, and from Jupiter. It's a fair size in Saturn, but Uranus, you can see it barely, and then by the time you get to uh, Neptune, yeah, I, I can't even see that spot on this here. And so, uh, and so in deep space, if you're not near a star, it's dark. It's very, very dark. So, um, but we're fortunately near a star. Um, now how empty, you, you don't think about this, but the space is actually what we on Earth would call a vacuum. Okay, there's very few molecules there on the Earth, and I just wanted to describe that to you somehow. I, I've used a vacuum, so I understand it a little bit. Many people don't. If you had an empty soft drink can, particularly, I had, pretend I had a, a Coke can up here sitting on the desk. If it were empty, if I drunk all the Coke out of it, here on Earth there'd be this many molecules in it, this one by followed by about 20 zeros. There'd be an incredible number of air molecules in that can. If that can is sitting in deep space, there's only 300. There'd be only 300 molecules in that. So deep space is actually about as good a vacuum, if not better, of any vacuum that we can create here on Earth. No matter what kind of vacuum pump you have or whatever, you can't hardly, you can just barely create a vacuum that's near the vacuum of deep space, which means there are basically no molecules there. Um, and so there, there are two theories, of course, like everything, a secular theory and a, and a supernatural theory. Uh, some say that we got here from a big bang. Um, others would say in the beginning God created the heavens uh, and the earth. It's fascinating that the earth is mentioned in the first verse of the Bible, right? Uh, but what about the big bang? Uh, it doesn't come till a lot later. Uh, in the big in the big bang um, uh, matter of fact people have tried to fit the big bang into the Bible uh, and make it try to make it fit uh, that's one of the main problems is that planets were formed last in a big bang theory model uh, and in the Bible the earth is mentioned first uh, and so the earth was there from the beginning, uh, from the creation in the beginning. Um, and, and, so, uh, and so, and that's a hard one to get around. There are others that are also difficult to get around, but it's, it's very hard to get around that difference. Uh, here's a secular theory of how things got here. We've talked about that a little bit already. Uh, in the beginning, there was, they don't, of course, they don't know where the stuff from the Big Bang came from, but wherever it came from, it exploded, and about, about 14 billion years ago, this slide's not quite right, uh, according to the secular folks. Uh, and then 10 billion years ago, you started to make a few stars. Five billion years ago, you started to make a secondary bunch of stars like the one that we have. Uh, and then they would say that the Earth was formed uh, about four and a half billion years ago. Uh, that stretches your imagination, I'm sure. Four and a, it's hard to imagine four and a half billion years. But that's what they'd say. Uh, and it started out molten. Uh, that's another stark difference between what the scripture says and what the secular theory says. Secular theory says it starts out molten, uh, which means it's too hot for water. So there was no water four and a half billion years ago, according to the secular folks. So how's that different than the earth today? And even what they would claim the earth even 3.8 billion years ago is the, the amount of water that came here to earth. And they have a great difficulty with that, is explaining where in the world did all of the water come from. So just think about it for a minute. We have, I think it's 310 million cubic miles of water on the earth. Okay, it's just an astounding I mean, if you've flown anywhere like from one continent to the other, you just fly over water forever and ever, and that water is a mile or two deep, and a lot of places, it's just, there's just an unbelievable amount of water here on the earth, and scientists have an incredible difficulty 
trying to explain how enough asteroids full of water got here to make that much water here on the earth. But according to their theory, you have to. Now, what does the Bible say about the water? Well, the earth was formed out of water. So from the biblical perspective, the water was here in the beginning, uh, and which, which fits the data a lot better uh, than to say that you, that you brought that much water here to the earth. It's, it's astounding to me that you, could, that you would try to claim that as a theory, but they do. Um, and, so, and so how did the uh, earth form? They say with a, whoops, it's off the top, the solar neb nebular theory is what they say. They say that uh, a star collapsed, that somehow a star was formed and then it collapsed and it made this big disk full of dust and whatever and that the middle part collapsed and made a star. Um, the theories just don't make any sense to me. It doesn't make, basically what they say that a star is formed by hydrogen, which is the lightest chemical element, collapsing and put under great pressure until a nuclear reaction starts. Well, and, and they, scientists believe that there's a nuclear reaction in the stars, and I believe that too. Um, but the trouble is to get a nuclear reaction started, you have to be at five million degrees, okay, to fuse hot one hydrogen atom with another. And to me, there's no way to get that hydrogen under that much pressure to get a nuclear reaction started. But that's what's what they say is how the stars formed. And so, uh, and so there's a lot of, a lot of issues here in, in terms of how you do that. Uh, and I, I really like this quote because. The, the scientists really think they had, they really thought they had a handle on how planets were formed, all right? And then, and then they finally admitted this, they've started to discover new planets outside of our solar system, all right? And the way they do that is that they watch uh, these objects move in front of stars with their powerful telescopes, and they infer what they see, and they infer those are planets, and they probably are. Uh, but they're finding planets that are so different than the planets that are here on Earth that they're having to throw out all their theories about how planets are formed. And so, but they're just now admitting that. So it's not. So if you, so if you read in the literature, you're going to say you're going to see that they think they know how all the planets are formed, but they really, they really don't, because these new planets that they're finding don't fit the theories. And it turns out even the planets that we have don't fit their theories either. Um, and so. And the biblical account, of course, is that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And so we started out with water, uh, and you see the triune nature of God there uh, even in the beginning. Okay. Um, another one of my favorite verses in Hebrews, Hebrews 11:3. Uh, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Okay. Um, now, what does that mean? Uh, I mean, I believe God created everything out of nothing. But I also believe that he created us out of things that are not visible. And so, atoms are not visible. Uh, and so, in a sense, I think that is also true of this verse, is that we're made out of things that are not visible. Um, and if you had any doubt, uh, Isaiah 45, 18 says that God made this world to be inhabited. And so he intended for us to live here. And he designed it, I believe, uh, I believe for us. Um, and I like this verse in Jeremiah uh, 10. He made the earth by his power. He established the world by his wisdom. And he stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Okay. He made the world by his power. Can you imagine being powerful enough to have made the earth? He established this world by his wisdom. And we're going to see a lot of his wisdom here uh, and how, in how he designed the earth. And then how in the world do you stretch out the heavens? Okay, how do you get a hold of the heavens and stretch them out? Well... I don't know, but God did that. And, and I believe, as we talked about, as I talked about in one of the questions we had, um, it affects a lot of things, how expanding the universe expects, it, 
um, changes a lot of things. Okay. Uh, again, the world was formed. We've talked about this already, and I'll probably just mostly skip over this. People are willingly ignorant, but what does it say? The earth was made out of water and by water in the sense, in that sense. Okay. Um, this is a, a fascinating verse in Ecclesiastes. Uh, you, you find, if you start looking in the Bible, you find a whole lot of verses that really apply to the science. The, the Bible, I don't think I've said this, the Bible is not a science book. It, that's not its primary purpose. But I believe when the Bible talks about science, it's, it's, it's accurate. I believe when the Bible talks about history, it's accurate. It's accurate in all respects. But its major purpose was not to tell us about how God did this. But it does do that. Um, all the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, they, there they flow again. And that's something we see is true. Um, but it's fascinating. We, the scientists, we call it the water cycle, okay? And we take this for granted, right? And we know about this already, but peoples before didn't know about this. There's tremendous water in the oceans. What happens to that water? It evaporates. It leaves the salt behind. The salt's not volatile. It, the water itself evaporates. It forms clouds. It rains. It snows. It sleets. It hails. But what, what, why did God do that? Well, he needed water all over the earth right and so how did how did he design the earth to do that he, this is what he designed is that the water in the oceans would go everywhere in the world and that was his plan and so as we see the water comes out of the ocean it comes down what does it do it flows back into the oceans and fills the oceans back up again um, it brings minerals back with it it's it's a complicated it's actually a very complicated process that we're just beginning to understand uh, but, but that's it. But I, I, I really like these verses in Isaiah that talk about this. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth, making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Then what, so he says, so God did this on purpose. He wanted to put water everywhere. And then what does he say in the next verse? So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without exceeding in the matter for which I have seen it, sent it. Um, and so God sent the water just like he sends his word with a purpose and he intends for that purpose to be accomplished and it is. Um, and, and so uh, it's, it's fascinating but he's designed a water cycle on the earth to bring water everywhere. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and then this one verse in Genesis, when I'm talking about climate change, which I'm not planning to do but just a little bit today, uh, or tomorrow, excuse me. Uh, but when, I, when people talk about climate change, I bring them back to Genesis 8.22. And what does it say? It says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So what promise has he given us? Here. What promise has God given us? That while the earth remains, now we know that at some point there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth, right? But until that time, while the earth remains, there's going to be seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, all the time. So what's he telling us? We're going to be able to grow food while we're here. We're, the, the, the solar system is going to be kind of like it is now. We're going to have day and night. We're going to have seasons. The earth is still going to be tilted on its axis, so we have seasons. We're going to, we're going to be able to grow crops. And so he's promised us. This is, this is a promise after Noah came off the ark. He said, I'm not going to destroy the earth again in the same way. And then he said this. He said, while the earth remains, you're going to be able to live here. Now, I try to remind people that, that are worried about global warming that he didn't say the temperature of the earth is going to be the same year after year after year. Okay, but he promised us it's going to be within a range that we can live, um, and so. Uh, and so, is this what you'd expect from a tremendous explosion, 
or from a majestic creation. Okay, and so we'll talk about that. Now let's talk about a little bit more about the design. Uh, why aren't we freezing? Why isn't it 460 minus 460 degrees Fahrenheit? Well, because of the sun. Um, and people talk about the sun. It turns out that the sun delivers the same amount of heat to the earth every day. Okay, now there are sunspots. And people talk about how that affects the earth, the energy from the sun, and it does. It, it affects it 1.1%, okay, one part in a thousand. So the energy from the sun changes one part in a thousand from the one, one end of the sunspot, no sunspots, to a lot of sunspots, okay. And so that sun is out there. I don't know whether we've got en engineers here or not, but I'd just like to challenge you to try to make something that gives exactly the same amount of heat every day for thousands of years, no maintenance needed. Uh, anybody think they can do that? Hanging out there in, in cold, dark, deep space, okay, unbelievable. Uh, he's, God found a way to provide us the heat and the light that we need every day, and he's found a consistent way to do it, uh, and he's put us in a place where we need to be from the sun to give us exactly what we need. Um, incredible, incredible. Um, the, as I said, the heat from the sun is from a nuclear reaction. What I mean by that is the sun fuses two hydrogen atoms together to make a helium atom. And we'll talk about that a little more, but not a lot, uh, just to give you an idea. But that, that causes an incredible amount of energy to be created with a small amount of mass. Uh, and that's how God's done it, created that much energy, because, I mean, the sun is 93 million miles away. Okay, so it's creating, and it's sending out heat in all different directions, not just to us. All right, and so the amount of heat it needs to send out is, is downright incredible. Um, and not only that, it sends us the heat from the center of the sun, and it sends us the light from the surface of the sun. If it did it the other way around, we'd be dead because the energy from the center, the light from the center of the sun would be like x-rays, and the light from the surface of the sun is, it just happens to be visible light, the, exactly the kind of light that we see with, okay? Another incredible coincidence, if you will. Um, and then, People say that we're the right distance from the sun. Well, in fact, we are, but that's not the whole story. Uh, the moon is the right, by that definition, the moon is the right distance from the sun too, right? Because it's the same distance as the earth is on the average from the sun. But uh, would you want to live on the moon? We've got a daytime temperature of 250 Fahrenheit and a nighttime temperature, if you're on the dark side, of a minus 250 Fahrenheit. Uh, the moon's not all that livable, okay? But it's the same distance from the sun, so what's different? What's different? Well, it's mainly the water and a little bit of carbon dioxide, and I'll explain that more here in a minute. But, but so it's not just being the right distance, it's the right distance if you take into account uh, the greenhouse gases. Uh, who's heard of greenhouse gases, anybody? I guess we all have at this point. Um, in a bad connotation, right? We've heard that CO, carbon dioxide is bad. It's a greenhouse gas and, it's, and, it's, and we're, at, we're at fault, uh, right? We've heard. Um, but it turns out that the Earth is 70 degrees warmer, 70 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the Moon, and the reason is greenhouse gases. Uh, and so we're the right distance from the Sun because we have greenhouse gases. If we didn't have them, we'd be freezing. I mean, even today, which is going to get to what 80, we the high today would have been without greenhouse gases. The high today would have been zero. Okay. And that's in the that's in the summer. Okay, we're we're in the fall now, I guess. But but that's in a warmer part. And the high today would have been zero without greenhouse gases. And it turns out that the major greenhouse gas. Well, let me actually explain how greenhouse gases work real quickly. 
it's like having a blanket over the earth, just like you have a blanket over you at night to hold the heat that your body is generating in. These greenhouse gases help hold the heat that the earth has absorbed from the sun and help hold it in. And so that's in a real quick way. That's, that's how it works. Um, whoops. Okay. Um, hang on just a second. Oh, there. Let me go back to that one. Um, the water, it turns out that the major greenhouse gas on the earth is water, not carbon dioxide. The people, you probably, unless you heard something recently from the media, they're starting to get the clue that the greenhouse, the main greenhouse gas is water. Uh, but carbon dioxide is a minor effect. It's not, it's not totally unimportant, but certainly man-made greenhouse gas, man-made carbon dioxide is a minor effect certainly compared to water. Uh, and so, uh, and so the, the, a lot of the, what we've heard is, is overblown. It's not that carbon dioxide doesn't have an effect, it does, but it's not the major effect that people think uh, that it is. Um, oh, and is the Earth's temperature being controlled? I believe that it is, and I believe that water is the key to controlling the temperature of the Earth. Uh, as far as one of the things that God created that's incredibly important for life, water's way at the top, okay? Because water is, in, it, water, it, life is critically, uh, uh, water's critically needed for life. Uh, water dissolves all kinds of things that we need dissolved. It, 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 the uh, chemistry of our bodies works in water, but that water that's on the earth, that's in the oceans, helps stabilize the temperature of the earth. And so it's hard to change the temperature of that much water very fast. And that's why the earth temperature stays very similar all the time. And that evaporation and condensation of the water, it helps take the temp it helps spread out that heat that the earth gets from the sun. Instead of like the moon where it just it just absorbs it and it's just there and it gets hot, the water the water carries not only the water itself all over the planet, it carries the heat with it and distributes the heat all over the planet. And so again, a brilliant design to be able to make this earth more livable. And that's the reason that the day and night difference in temperature is much less, is because of the water also. Um, and so uh, here's real quick, just a uh, best we have kind of temperature of the earth for the last 2,000 years. Uh, this, is the, this is not great data, but it's the best we have. And it just shows you that the temperature has been up and down. It was up a thousand years ago when the Vikings went to Greenland to farm. Uh, uh, they left a few hundred years later because the temperature went back down again. Uh, but it, there was a warm period about a thousand AD. There's another warm period now. Uh, I think it's not even quite as warm as it was a thousand years ago because you can't farm in Greenland today. Okay, it's still ice covered. And so it's, at least in terms of Greenland, the temperature is less today than, than it was then. And so where will the Earth's temperature go from now? I have no clue, uh, but I'm not sure the people that are trying to predict it have a much better clue. Uh, and then we went from that hot period to, an, to a little ice age, particularly in Europe. Um, and they had a hard time growing crops in Europe for quite a while uh, because of that little ice age. Um, and so the temperature goes up and down, uh, but it's still within a livable range. Uh, as I said, water has fascinating properties. I've already talked about some of this. Um, it makes beautiful snowflakes. Uh, there's no two snowflakes that look alike, believe it or not. Uh, uh, the, the surface tension of water is just right so that plants work. They can take water up through their roots and up to the plants. Um, it, it, water has a lot of properties that just happen to be exactly right for what needs to happen on the earth. So I think it was one of God's greater inventions, really. Um, carbon dioxide, um, where would we be without carbon dioxide on the earth? Um, we'd be without life uh, because you need carbon dioxide. What, a, what, a, what, what needs carbon dioxide? Plants. and. Without carbon dioxide, there'd be no plants. Without plants, there'd be no animals. Uh, we wouldn't have anything to eat. Uh, and so as you see here, um, the plants need carbon dioxide, and the more that they have, the faster they grow in general. Uh, and so 
So while carbon dioxide, the scientists think, is a bad thing, um, it at some level is critical. Uh, carbon dioxide level right now is about 420 parts per million. Uh, what that means is about one molecule out of 2,000 in the air is a carbon dioxide molecule, which is not much, but it's enough for plants to grow. Um, and so, but if it gets below about 180 parts per million, plants don't grow very well. Uh, and so that would be a problem. Alrighty, um, let's see. <laughs> Another thing that plants do that you probably didn't think about is plants absorb the energy from the sun and convert that into chemical energy for us to eat, if you will. Um, and so without a complicated photosynthesis process, there also wouldn't be life here on Earth. Um, and I just wanted to show you a little bit about that. Um, there are about 50 enzymes that work, 50 to 100 enzymes that work together along with about 100 to 200 cofactors. So there's say three or 400 molecules, some of them giant, big, some of them small, that work together to absorb the, the rays from the sun and convert them into useful energy. Uh, this is one incredibly complicated process. Uh, that the scientists believe came about by accident. Okay, another one. It's almost as complicated as the DNA replication that I was showing you, where DNA gets copied. Um, it is just these these enzymes. There, this doesn't this diagram doesn't do it justice. These there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of, of atoms there in this picture. If you could see all the detail of it. Uh, but uh, but that just those molecules just happen to absorb the kind of energy that the sun produces, uh, which just coincidentally happens to be the 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 range of energy that we need to see, um, which of course is not coincidental at all. God designed it all, uh, but that just gives you an idea of how complex it is. Another thing that people don't often think about is the association between plants and animals. Uh, what is it that we need? Well, we need oxygen and food. Okay, um, and what do we give off? We give off carbon dioxide. Okay, so we breathe in oxygen. It goes to all parts of our body. Our blood brings the carbon dioxide back to our lungs and we breathe it back out. So who needs the carbon dioxide? Well, the plants, and what do the plants produce? Why, well, just coincidentally, they produce oxygen and food for us, okay? And so this relationship, I mean, I've showed some of the specific relationships, but the more that I've studied this, the more that I see that there are thousands and thousands of these relationships within nature. I, I, this, this year I've been, I've been growing monarch butterflies for my grandchildren, okay? And where do you find the monarch butterfly caterpillars? You, you find them on milkweed. Why is that? Because they eat milkweed, and they, they survive on milkweed and like and like kind of plants, and they don't survive on anything else, okay? And they go an incredible metamorphosis from being an egg to a, to a larva to a caterpillar to a butterfly. Um, in God's beautiful design, but there are thousands and thousands of relationships between plants and animals here on earth where one doesn't survive without the other. And how in the world could you have evolved that kind of situation? You, 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 they, the only answer is that you'd have to evolve them together, but then how would that work? Uh, I mean, how would you evolve a clownfish and uh, the, uh, the anemone, the, the sea creature there, the anemone, at the same time. They both need each other. The clownfish needs protection. They, we're just now studying that relationship between those two things. Uh, it turns out that the clownfish grits its teeth and makes a funny noise and keeps some of the predators away from the anemone. We didn't know that for a while. 
I mean, it's just the, the relationship. The, 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 we just don't even, we're just beginning to understand the relationships that God has designed between the plants and the animals. But, and it's just, it's just fascinating to me to see, see all these things. That, uh, I mean, where would, the, where would the bees and other pollinators be without flowers? Uh, where would the flowers be without the bees? Uh, I mean, it just all fits together perfectly. Um, and, and how it could have been evolved, it, it, escapes, it escapes my understanding. Um, I, oh, well, I, I'm going to skip uh, some of the rest of this, but, but have you ever read in the Bible about the earth's foundation? You remember reading verses in there about the earth's foundation? And uh, what was it? Well, who was it that, that God asked about the earth's foundation? Wasn't it Job? It Job where, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Okay. And he's sitting there going, and what is the foundation of the earth? I, I just wanted to show you what little we know about the foundation of the earth right now. We've got, earth has got a bunch of layers. We're on the top. There, there are several layers in between. And then there's what I'd call the foundation, which is the core of the earth, okay? Well, now, what is that core made of? Well, it's made of the, the outer part of the core is actually liquid, okay? So the foundation of the earth is actually partly liquid, okay? Now, what do you, you, when you think about a foundation, do you think about a liquid or not? Well, the foundation of the earth is liquid, and what does that liquid iron do when it rotate when it when it goes around and around when the earth rotates? It creates a magnetic field. What does that magnetic field do? It protects us from the cosmic rays. <laughs> Again, an incredible design to protect us from the bad things that the sun does put out um, and does that. Now, the solid part of the core where the pressure is really high in the middle of the earth is also iron, and it's also solid. And so the center of the earth, the actual dead center of the earth, is a solid. But part of the foundation, what I consider part of the foundation of the earth, and what he was asking Job about, which Job had no clue about. Matter of fact, if you go to and read all those 70 some odd questions that God asked Job, we'd still have a hard time answering most of those today. Okay, and we, and we still would. Uh, but, uh, and we still do. Um, that's it, I think, oops, sorry, there we go. Oh, the, and then there's the rotation of the earth. It rotates at the right speed, so the winds are not that high. Uh, we orbit the earth in a, in a way that, that makes the different climates. Uh, we have, life is timed to that 24 hour a day cycle. We don't think about that till we get jet lag and we get on an airplane, go to Italy and, and get jet lag. We don't think about that, but, uh, but our bodies are timed to this climate. Uh, to this cycle of day and night. Um, animals are timed to that cycle of day and night. Uh, the deer in the spring start mating when the, when the timing is right based on the amount of light in the day. Uh, just all those things that we don't think about are done. Uh, as I said, these planets don't actually fit the theory that people say uh, that mercury is too dense um, it has too many volatile elements. Uh, Venus appears to have had its surface renewed recently, and we don't understand that. Venus actually rotates backwards. Okay, all the planets rotate this way, except Venus, it rotates this way. Nobody knows why. Um, the Earth has a large amount of water and oxygen. Surprise, surprise, we just happen to need that. No other planet has those kind of things. Um, let's see, the Earth, we have a magnetic field that's decaying and indicates that it has, we haven't been here that long. Uh, Mars has uh, obvious erosion patterns. The scientists believe that there was a global flood on Mars, but they don't believe there was a global flood on the Earth. Okay, uh, think about that one for a while. Uh, there's not a drop of liquid water on Mars today, okay, but there's an oceans, oceans full of water on the Earth today, uh, and so uh, the other planets, uh, Ju uh, Jupiter rotates too fast. Uh, Fifty of its moons rotate backwards. Uh, let's see. Uh, Uranus is one of my favorite. Uranus 
actually, you know, Earth stands up like this and rotates this way. Uranus sits like this and rotates this way, okay? And so it doesn't fit the theory either. Neptune, gener Neptune generates more, more heat than it, than it takes in. Nobody understands that. Uh, they're just an just incredible amount of things that people don't understand. Um, uh, the water, uh, you know, uh, the human, we're about 60% water. Plants are about 85% water. Jellyfish are about 95% water. Now think about that for a minute. Jellyfish, one out of 20 molecules is not water in a jellyfish, okay? Uh, and so, <laughs> How in the world could you make an animal that had one molecule, one molecule out of 20 was not water? Uh, it, just unbelievable to me. I talked about the magnetic field already generated there. Uh, and I talked a little bit about Job already um, and how God challenged Job uh, to answer his questions. Uh, and Job finally decided he couldn't do that. Um, and so... Um, the, the thing I want, the, the one point I want you to make, and, and a serious point now, about when you meet people that are deathly concerned about global warming, okay? Now, you're going to meet people like that, and maybe there's some in this room um, that are deathly concerned about global warming. If, if you believe that the earth came about by accident, okay, now think about this, right? Put, you in a place, put yourself in a place of a secular person. If you believe the earth came about by accident, the earth could and and became livable by accident okay then it could just on the same argument become unlivable by accident too okay and so there's a real there's a real reason there that that secular folks are concerned because they don't believe there's somebody holding this earth together okay they don't believe somebody created it with a purpose they don't believe somebody's holding it together every day and night every day like God is holding a creation together as it says in Colossians and so and so you're going to run into people that are concerned very concerned about what's going to happen to this earth and what's so what I want you to understand is that when you when you talk to those kind of folks you need to understand right away that they don't have the same worldview that you do okay that I hope that you do and so and so that's a challenge uh, for us is to understand that they don't have the same confidence in this uh, in this and of course I, I mean this is this earth is I didn't say this in the beginning this earth it, it, we could call it a temporary home but this is not our home okay not long term okay and so uh, and so we understand that too whereas folks that are secular don't don't really understand that so but if you believe in God's word then you have every reason to believe that God is going to keep his promises and what did he promise us in Genesis 8 22 he said while the earth remains you're going to be able to live here uh, and uh, and he says is that when the earth doesn't remain anymore if you're a follower of his you're going to be with him and it and nothing else really matters uh, and so uh, oh, there we go. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief which, uh, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with an intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. So there is a coming day of global warming, but it's going to be a little more than the people had in mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, if, now, I don't, I don't fully understand these verses, don't pretend to, but if... The translation is right and the elements are burned up uh, the only way you burn up an element is to get to about five million degrees okay to five to ten million degrees and that at that temperature the elements start to come apart okay and inside our Sun the elements are apart okay and we'll talk about what the temperature inside the Sun is next next uh, tomorrow uh, but and so uh, and so if that really means that the elements are going to be burned up, then uh, we're talking 5, 10 million degrees. So that's, just, that's not a minor amount of global warming. I, like I said, again, I don't pretend to fully understand that. Uh, but, uh, but according to his promises, we're going to be looking forward to a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, different than now. 
Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. And so that's my challenge to, to you as we, uh, as we end today, uh, is, to, is to remember, is to stand with your biblical worldview, understand that God's in control, um, uh, and that, that we need to be spotless and blameless in the meantime until he comes again. All righty, um, if you, if you want to hang around for just a minute, I'll be glad to answer your questions if you have any. Does anybody have any questions or not? Anybody? Yeah. Right. magnetic field is decaying, yes. It, yeah. That it would... Ah, okay. 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 The question is about the magnet. Let me repeat it for everybody that couldn't hear it. The question is about the magnetic field and is it going to decay to such an extent that it's going to be a problem for us uh, in the near future and I don't think so but uh, it's decaying the, the reason I said it was decaying is because it appears to be as we've measured it over the years even within the time frame that we've been able to measure the magnetic field of the earth it is declining and it is declining at a rate that leads us to believe the earth is a few thousand years old. Uh, that it was a certain, it, but if it were a few million years old and it, de and it decayed, it would have been crushing, uh, and a crushing amount of a magnetic field that we wouldn't have been able to survive. But, and so, and so I don't think that's going to be an issue. I think there's going to be enough of a, uh, of a magnetic field for a many years to come. It is, but it is, but we are able to measure a decay. And so that's not something I'm worried about at this point. I, but I don't know when the Lord's going to come back. And so I, I don't know for sure. Yeah, they do. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. I don't think there. Uh, I don't think there's any alarmism about that, and mainly because this points to a young Earth. Okay, and, and that that fact that the, the 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 magnitude of the magnetic field and how it's decaying really doesn't fit with an old earth. And uh, the sci scientists can't, at this point, abide a young earth uh, because it's inconsistent. Everybody would believe that that's inconsistent with evolution, right? And so, and so you'd have to change all your theories. Uh, and, I, and I predict they're gonna change the evolutionary theory because it actually doesn't fit the facts now. At the facts as we know them now, evolution doesn't fit them, okay? And so scientists are gonna be forced to change. The trouble that they have is that they don't have the next new theory down pat yet, and so they can't switch from the old one until they have a new one that they like better, okay? And so, and so they can't really switch from an evolutionary theory that doesn't, that, like the current one that I don't think works, and I think most of them, even in the field, would, would probably agree with that in private. They wouldn't agree with it in public, okay? But they won't agree with it. But as soon as they get a new theory that they think fits better, they'll, they'll switch, and then evolution will be an afterthought, and it'll be gone, and you know, we'll be on to something new. But there always is going to have to be an alternative theory to the one in this book uh, because people don't like the one in this book <laughs> and so they're gonna need and that's the way scientists work uh, they they need they need to be able to they want the scientists particularly the professional ones in the universities want to be able to say how it is okay and if if you go and you say well there are flaws in your theories they 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 don't like that you know, they, you're messing with their worldview and so and so when they have a better theory they'll let us know uh, and and we'll and we'll start to shoot holes in that theory too, uh, but that's that's for the future. That's for
the future. Yeah, uh, Lee. Yeah, the, Lee's asking, uh, you know, the, the speed at which science travels does seem to increase, have increased dramatically. The speed at which everything happens seems to be increasing dramatically. Um, and I can't keep up. Uh, I, I, I can't keep up with the, the vocabulary for our new, our new gender ideologies and all these new things. I mean, they change weekly or monthly or whatever, and, and science, and science is tending to move in that direction too and changing but, but in the defense of science just a little bit science as we know more information science is supposed to change okay because there because it's their theories remember we can't prove anything and so their theories and so what what scientists try to do is promote the best explanation that they have the best natural explanation they have for how things got came to be and, and so that's what they're trying to do. And so as, as information is coming faster, they're having to change things faster. And so that's the reason for it, I think, is, is that information is coming at us at such a great speed now that, that, uh, that it, it's, a, it's a challenge uh, for, for scientists. It's a challenge for any of us to keep up. We're not going to be able to keep up, but we can keep up with maybe one small part. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, I think, a consequence of just how fast things are coming. How fast things are coming. Yeah. Well, you're, um, you're on. Yeah. <laughs> I got a microphone. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned earlier about mutations. Mm -hmm. And I always felt that evolution depended largely on mutations for positive changes mm -hmm. for uh, the evolutionary process. But it seems to me that most of the um, mutation, like a birth defect, are negative and temporary. Mm -hmm. Like if a person born with six feet, they don't pass that on generation to generation. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can comment a minute on that? Yeah, I, I can, and I'll be talking about that more in detail tomorrow. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, it turns out that most, that a lot of mutations are what they call neutral, which means you can't tell it. Okay, and so uh, the, the bad, matter of fact, the bad news is that that every new generation has about 100 new mutations. Okay, and so your children have 100 more mutations than you did, and their children are gonna have a more, 100 more mutations than your children. And so that's just a, a scientific fact. Uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, as I said earlier, there are a lot of places in the DNA where it's not critical that a mutation occurs, but there's some places where it's critical, uh, and some of these diseases, are, it's critical. And so our modern medicine is saving us to some degree from this effect of these increasing mutations. Uh, and so that's the reason we're not going downhill any faster than we are. I think, is is that our modern medicine is helping us. Okay, and so I, I don't know. I I'm not sure I'd be here with without modern medicine. I don't know. Some of you might or might not be. I, I don't know. Uh, but it's it modern medicine is helping. But the background mutation level is is there, uh, and and it's been there for a long time, and it's I'm afraid it's going to be there uh, for the future. And so while there is a very rare mutation that might possibly be considered positive that's I haven't seen any evidence of any mutation that I thought was positive but there's some people that claim that some are maybe that's true but but most mutations are either neutral or highly negative yeah yeah so I was just gonna make a comment so yeah. it's really we live in a um, Really, we live in a cursed world where we have de-evolution and not evolution, <laughs> if you look at it yeah. that way. Yeah, 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 and so we, and we do. The, this world is decaying, uh, and 
And we have another thing I'll talk about tomorrow if I have a chance um, is we ha in our bodies we have DNA repair enzymes. Okay, our DNA is degraded every day. Okay, a lot every day. And their DNA repair mechanism proteins that are in there trying to fix your DNA day and night. And they're working hard and they're able to do it mostly okay. But that's another thing. How in the world could a DNA repair mechanism enzyme have evolved? Okay, if you want something to think about over the, even, over the evening, just think about that for a minute. How could a DNA repair enzyme have evolved? Okay, but without them, we wouldn't be here because our, our DNA is, is mutating at a, at a pretty rapid rate every day, okay? But you're in, there are enzymes in there fixing it every day, okay? And so, and so again, uh, you know, we're falling apart. Um, uh, you know, uh, that's the bad news is. Uh, we, we've got a home in heaven, and so that's good. Uh, but, but yeah, the, the mutation, it's hard to imagine how mutations help and there are people now starting to do calculations and showing this mathematically, how difficult it is to find, uh, to improve a, a, a group of individuals. If you just take a group of individuals and put in a, a mutation rate and all this kind of stuff and try to show that evolution of a new trait could be possible, it doesn't work. It, it doesn't work. And so, uh, and so it just, it doesn't seem it just doesn't seem reasonable. And if I have time, I'll talk about that a little more tomorrow. But, but it is just, to find a positive mutation is uh, very difficult because people don't understand that, that your DNA is read in a, any one specific piece of your DNA may be a part of several different enzymes. Okay, and so if you change one of your one of your DNA uh, pieces, that affects a lot of things, okay? And people don't, particularly in certain spots in your DNA, and people don't understand that. And so why would a mutation that, it might fix one problem and it might cause three others, okay? If you changed it just one letter in your DNA, it, it, may, cause, it may help you one way, but it may hurt you 10 ways. Uh, and so that's the problem uh, with, yeah. Dr. White, is there any way to reconcile the difference that science puts on the time, uh, age timeline of the earth with what the Bible says the timeline is? Um, I, I don't think so. Uh, now, a lot of Christians do. Okay, there are a lot of Christians that believe in an old earth. Um, I, I don't see any way to do it. And the, the main problem, there, there are a couple, but one of the main problems is the sin and death problem. Um, is, that, is that if death didn't come until Adam and Eve sinned, then, then how could there have been, how could there have things evolved the way they did? It, it just doesn't, it doesn't really fit very well. Uh, I mean, and the scientific evidence, I'll, in a minute, and the scientific evidence it really lines up pretty well with a young earth, but people are just now starting to see that. And so, uh, and so the mainline scientists don't see that yet at all. And, and so, uh, I mean, I have a number of brothers and sisters in Christ who, are, who, who believe in an old earth, and, and uh, you know, and, and I don't worry about them too much if that's the only, if that's the only thing they have in conflict with the way I would see the Bible, but that's often not true. Go ahead. Well, I'm dealing at home with a husband who's an atheist, and, okay. and uh, of course his, his cry is, well, you say the earth is only a few thousand years old. Right. Um, science has proven that it's millions of years old, right. so how do you, right. you know, right. so you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, 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 oh, I've been told that before. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, w one thing I would uh, encourage to, uh, there, are, there are a number of kind of new evidences that are coming up that, um, that I would encourage him to look at. And the most fascinating one to me, uh, I don't know if I was going to talk about this one or not, is the dinosaurs, okay? And what, let me just tell you just a real quick story about the dinosaurs. 
uh, they were searching for dinosaurs out west, uh, and they found a T-Rex, an articulated skeleton, which means all the bones were there, basically. Um, and they were giddy and loving this, and they were excavating all the bones. And, and what they do with these bones is they wrap them up in cement uh, and carry them off to the laboratory and study the bones. So they dig them out of the ground, wrap them up in cement, carry them out. Well, they got to the femur bone, the upper leg bone of the T-Rex. Uh, and they, in the helicopter they were using, couldn't lift it. Okay, I mean the 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 bone. I mean the bone is six or eight feet long, and it's 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 about this big around, and it's just it's massive. And then you put a, a cement casing on it, and they couldn't lift it. And so they finally decided, well, we're going to have to cut it in half. Okay, and they hate to do that kind of stuff, but they cut the thing in half, and they took the fragments and they sent it to North Carolina State University for Mary Schweitzer to look at. And she looked at it, and she dissolved the hard part of the bone, and there were soft parts left in the bone. Now, these dinosaurs are supposed to be 65 million years old, right? Or the, the youngest they could be, the scientists say, is 65 million years old. They started, she started dissolving the hard parts of the bone, just like, I mean, you could take a chicken bone today and just and put it in acetic acid, put it in vinegar, strong vinegar, and it'll dissolve the hard part of the bone after a while. Uh, and you'll be left with, blood vessels and, and, you know, organic kind of tissues left, uh, and nerves in there. I mean, if you've ever broken a bone, you know there are nerves in your bones, okay, because it hurts like bad. And so, uh, and, so, and so there are these organic materials inside the bones. Well, she cut these things apart, and she did it. She did this thing, experiment like 17 times because she couldn't believe it because she looked inside, and she starts seeing flexible materials inside these dinosaur bones that are supposed to be 65 million years old. So see flexible things, she started looking at them and she and she looked at them and thought, those look like blood vessels, she said. Those look like blood vessels and so she was willing to admit that they were blood vessels and then she showed a picture and she put it in Science Magazine which is what I'd encourage you to get your husband to look up, tell him to look up soft tissue in dinosaurs. Okay, and he'll find Mary Schweitzer's work right away. It's in it's in it's in reputable scientific journals. Okay, and she shows a picture in there of these blood vessels, and inside those blood vessels is what looks exactly like a red blood cell, exactly like a red blood cell. Now she's unwilling to say it's a red blood cell, but I've shown the pictures to young men like the one sitting back there that was helping me earlier. And they raise, I say, what is that? And they raise their hands and say, that's a red blood cell. So, any, so it, it clearly is, it, it's even red, okay? They, they, didn't even, they didn't even dye the pictures. The, blood, the, the red blood cells were still red, okay? And so could, a, could after 65 million years, there be a red blood cell? Could there even be a flexible blood vessel inside a bone? It's, it's madness to believe. As an organic chemist, it's, it's madness to believe that that could have lasted. Everybody knows that when stuff dies, it decays, right? I mean, everybody knows that. And so it, it, it's just, to me, that's some of the most fascinating evidence recently that those dinosaurs were buried in a global flood. If you, it's hard for me to believe that even a few thousand years old, you could find a red blood cell inside a dinosaur bone that was buried in the flood. It's hard for me to believe it lasted that long, but certainly not 65 million years. And so, so that's just one of the evidences, but it's fascinating evidence that the regular scientists, they're trying to, they're trying to say, well, it, you know, they're trying to explain it somehow. But, but to me, it's some of the more interesting evidence recently that, but, but yeah, I understand that. Um, um, uh, you know, just keep pointing them to the truth uh, of what's in the scriptures. I, I know it's hard. I, I know it's a challenge uh, to do, but but um, there's more and more evidence. But evidence ultimately is probably not going to win him to Christ. The Holy Spirit's got to change his heart, you know. And so, uh, but but if you can clear away some of the brush, which is what I kind of try to do with this ministry, is I try to clear away the objections people have so that they can actually focus on the truth of what. God's word says about their lives. And so 
But, but just challenge them with that and say, well, how, how in the world does red blood cells last for 65 million years? You know, and see, see if that would have an effect. But, but, but yeah, there, there, there's a lot of evidence out there that people believe that proves the earth is old. But as I said earlier, we can't know what happened in the past uh, as scientists. Uh, we can only do experiments that give us some information about what might have happened in the past. But all those, all those experiments that talk about the past depend on assumptions we make about what was true in the past. And if those assumptions are right, then the conclusions we have are right. If those assumptions are wrong, then the conclusions are wrong. And that's my contention, is that the assumptions that were made about the past were wrong and that, that the earth is not old. Uh, and so uh, not everybody agrees with me on that. But, uh, but I, the scriptures seem clear to me. Uh, the genealogies seem clear uh, that, that, uh, that Jesus believed what was in the Old Testament. Uh, he said he did. Uh, and so I, um, I tend to think he knows <laughs> how old the earth is. Uh, and so, so I believe it's young, but, but I don't, I, I try, it's not a salvation issue, that, that, that issue itself isn't, but it distracts a lot of people. And so I, I try to help people see, see that I believe the earth fits what scriptures say just exactly like it's written. Um, and so, but, and I try to help people see that. So, so maybe he will see. That's, well, we'll have another time uh, yep. Tomorrow.